You need handouts? Is that why you have your hands up from last time? Dan, these two guys, these people in the middle here. All right, we're at Left Kandi, the site of Left Kandi on the island of Euboea in central Greece. Take a handout, please. Thank you. And uh, we're almost done here. We're almost done um, looking at this site. If you've done the reading, you know that this building was called by the excavators the Heroon, H-E-R-O-O-N. A Heroon is a word from later Greek archaeology and literary studies that means a building dedicated to a hero, for a hero. Who's a hero? A hero is a person who in Greek mythology was halfway between deity and a mortal. He was somebody who was a mortal, but better. He was like Brett Favre. <laughs> and whoever it is who's going to do it today for the twins. Yes. Um, so, uh, so they are assuming, therefore, or they're concluding, actually, that uh, this structure was erected in honor of the man who was cremated and buried uh, in this shaft grave in the middle of the Heroon uh, in an heirloom my bronze Mycenaean crater. And we know from thatch that was found on the floor, on the clay floor of the Heroon building, that much of it was completed and, in fact, even roofed. And uh, almost all of it may well have been. But down here at this end, please take handouts, down here at this end, at the, at the, at the far end of the 45 meter long structure, uh, there were some tombs, sub uh, My Mycenaean tombs, Mycenaean chamber tombs. And they made the ground unstable. And so um, this end of the building collapsed. And it must have collapsed not too long after um, the, the, the parts of the roof that went over the main building were constructed. Because there's not much evidence of long period of internal use of the building. The clay floor has very little in the way of tramped on broken pieces of pottery. And in archaeological sites, uh, tramped on broken pieces of pottery are super common in clay floors. They're uh, the standard kind of garbage that gets um, tamped down into the floor. So the, ver the lack of it here suggests that the building wasn't open and, and entered for very much time at all. The huge mound that gave the site its name, Tumba, had 26,000 sherds. And these are some of them. And we got to this point last time and decided on the date of the construction of the mound. What did we decide? What's the date? Tenth. Because because the because the pottery is protogeometric in style, like these protogeometric vases here. So sometime in the tenth century, the mound is put over here. Now, working with uh, your best friend sitting next to you, this is what you've got on your handout. So you want to write this on your handout. Put these things in order. In chronological order, begin with the earliest, go to the latest. So of course, I totally forgot. I just started talking. And you did not jump up and say, Professor Berlin, you were supposed to remember to say this. So now I'll have to do it on Thursday. Okay. Should I remind you again? Yes. Okay. I will. <laughs> but Thursday we're going to hand back the paper, so it'll be easier for me to remember. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. 
You guys should be talking to each other. This is better if you're talking to somebody. It's easier if you're talking. Right. Good point. I'm going to start with you guys. I'll start with you, and I'm just going to go down your row. <laughs> How's it going? Good. If we, uh, <clears throat> my new chamber tunes right before, how do we use <laughs> What'd you say? Did we find like pottery in the Mycenaean chamber tunes? Oh, there was pottery found in them. That's how they know they're Mycenaean. Oh, okay. But we don't, you can't use like the proto or like the geometric things to date back until here. Well, if there's Mycenaean pottery in the chamber tombs, one of the chamber tombs date to. Like 11 CC? That was like on the floor. Or even. I have to fix this. <laughs> All right. Okay. Ready? Got it all worked out? <laughs> Think so. Okay, Nebraska. Say what? Is that me? Well, I have this thing turned way down. What is the problem? Just hold on a second there. Uh, where's the... Oh, shoot. I can't get the... Um, I'll go away. I don't want that. I want the volume control. All right, never mind. Um, I, I, I just try to stop squeaking. All right. Um, sorry. Back there. One more time. The, whoa, whoa, whoa. I need to, you want 280 to be the earliest? I need the earliest. Uh, person, person next to you, what did you think? Tomb, tomb 80 as the earliest thing? The earliest in date? What, what's the date of tomb 80? 800 to 750. Write, write that down. 800 to 750. You, you too. Ne next person in that, in that row, what did you have as the earliest thing? The, the Mycenaean chamber tombs, what's the date? <laughs> you break my heart. You know that? Just, I, what's with the shrug? We spent three weeks on this period. What's the date? What's the day of the Mycenaean period? What are you shaking your head for? Oh my God! Helper, quick, everybody, in a resounding roar. What's the date of the Mycenaean period? I hear nothing. That's hard. <laughs> yeah, let's let's try the 13th century. That'd be great. 13th century. That would be um, digits that begin with the number 12. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's say, let's say that the Mycenaean chamber tombs are 1250 BCE. 
And what'd you give me, um, you two back here, for the date of 280? Okay, which comes first? Yes. I don't know what the problem is here. I, I don't know where to put this. I, it's like migrating down to my belly button. I don't, uh, maybe this will make it better. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So let's all agree that the Mycenaean chamber tombs precede tomb 80 by about how many years? You two back there? About how many years is between them? Twelve hundred to eight hundred. How many years? Thank you. Four hundred years earlier. All right. Four hundred years earlier. So the Mycenaean chamber tombs need to be first. Next person in that row. What comes next? Tomb one and three. What's the date of tombs one and three? Okay. We're going to have a whole bunch of stuff in the tenth century, and then we're going to have to have a little discussion about what comes first. Tombs one and three, tenth century. Next person in that row, what do you think comes next? Uh, the centaur is also tenth century. The centaur is also tenth century. Very good. Does the centaur come before or after tombs one and three? The centaur comes after tombs one and three. Where's, where's the centaur found? Where's the centaur found? Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Uh, the two centaurs, one and two, one, one and two, three? Thank you. Yes, the head is in tomb one and the body is in tomb three. So which comes first? Tombs one and three or the centaur? Centaur. Right. Centaur has to predate tombs one and three. Otherwise, you can't break it and stick one part in one place and one part in the other. Next person in that row. The tomb mound is the 10th century. Uh-huh. The tomb mound is the 10th century. Just looking at the plan and thinking about this, which do you think comes first, tombs one and three or the tomb mound? Who am I talking to back there? I cannot hear you. Because? How many people think the tomb amount comes before tombs one and three? I, wh yo, how many people think that d at least one person has to raise their hand because one person just said that? The tomb amount comes first. Raise your hand. Hardly anybody. Very few people. Tombs one and three precede. So most of you think there was a cemetery already here, and then and then this was this was um, constructed. Is that what you guys think? Yeah? No, it doesn't. <laughs> All right, hold on to that. Um, so, uh, so we've got the tomb mound next. Is that right? S Do we have the tomb mound next? We have the Mycenaean chamber tombs. That's, those are definitely first. The centaur has to come before tombs one and three. The, the 10th century, of course, is a whole 100 years, so we have a lot of time to play with here. So is the tomb of mound, is the tomb of mound the next thing? Next person in that row. Uh, no, it is not. Thank you. Why not? Because the mound was erected over the uh, structure after it was destroyed. You are. The funeral of the man and the woman. What is the evidence for the funeral? What kind of funeral was it? Next person in that row. Uh, well, they were cremated. well he, he was cremated. She's not cremated because she's all there. Exactly, exactly. And what's the evidence? Where, where did the cremation take place? Um, it was on like a big brick 
It's, yeah, yeah, where on this plan? Where on this plan? Have I run out of people in that row? Where am I? Ra raise your hand, the last person who talked. I have run out of people in that row. Person in the row ahead of you. Where, where is the evidence for a pyre? Yeah, where? It, yeah, right here, exactly. What does the as evidence consist of? Next person. Um, no, not exactly. This, this rock area was leveled and it was burned and there were post holes on either side. So there's a flat leveled burned area. Is that what you guys down here were going to say? I can rely on you folks down here. That's good. All right. Um, so there was a cremation here and then there was um, uh, some sort of burial. What, what? Other things in this list need to go along with with that. Next person. Yeah, the horse sacrifice. Exactly. All right. Um, so now we've got in close conjunction with one another the funerals of the man and the woman, the horse sacrifice, the construction of the tomb mound. Say what? And the, and the burials. Yes, thank you. The, 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 funeral, the funerals and the burials of the man and the woman. And um, the horse sacrifice and the construction of the tomb of Mount. Those have to happen in close proximity. And you want that cluster of things to happen after this cemetery has already started. You want the cemetery to already start? Yes? Yes? Why? Well, the front of that thing collapsed, showing that they didn't know there were burials already there, which meant that there were burials already there. So why can't you bring burials back to the cemetery? Does that make any sense? No. That doesn't make any sense, because these are, these are 300 years earlier than any burials around here at all and they're underground and nobody knows they're here so that so these burials don't really have anything to do with these burials the the the, the mycenaean chamber tombs that's the earlier ones that you were talking about so i reject that reasoning and that is a good example <laughs> sorry and that is a good example of how you can know too much you know it once we know all of the things that are there it's a little hard to untangle um, you, have, you have to remember what people there wouldn't have known. So, so these burials were invisible, and nobody knew they were there, because had they known, they would have not built this building exactly where it was. So it's more or less a coincidence that uh, um, this stuff is in proximity to this stuff, because they're many hundreds of years apart. All right. Uh, people who believe that this cemetery is already in use before this. Raise your hand. Why? You just feel like it should be. <laughs> People who think that the, that the cemetery was already in use. Why? What does um, a, a, a single elaborate burial structure remind you of? A single elaborate burial structure, Catherine. Uh, the Tholos tombs. tombs. Are you a person who thinks that uh, the cemetery is here and then this gets built? I think that there, it might be because um, you can see how like the burials seem kind of like it, it might be 
my guess would be that it continued in use because the rails kind of go around where the mound is. They curve right there. But this one has a blocking wall next to those burials, and to me that indicates like some sort of awareness that something is there that you need a blocking wall for, whereas on the other side, they clearly weren't aware of the mites in the burials. So the, I don't know if that's right. That's this, right. this blocking wall preserves the mound um, that, that covered, that took the building over. That's what this blocking wall does. Oh, okay. Never mind. It holds the mound in place. Um, on the basis simply of the pottery and the dates of the pottery, the dates of all of this, you, you can't decide. You just have to think about the probabilities. What most of the archaeologists, uh, including the ones who excavated here, think is that this is the earliest construction in the geometric period. Obviously, the Mycenaean chamber tombs come, come first. That is that um, the funerals, the burials, the horse sacrifice, and the building are built, um, and then this end collapses, and then the mound is constructed, and this is the retaining wall of the mound, and then to be associated with and to, and to be in proximity to the burial of somebody who was clearly very important, a kind of a hero for this community, that inspired other people to want to be buried near this person. And so this cemetery grew up almost immediately, as we can tell from tombs one and three in the centaur. It started almost immediately. And it continues until when? What's the duration of the tomb of cemetery? At least on the evidence that I've given you so far. Down into the uh, eighth century. Down into the middle ge geometric period. And one of the things that you should note is that by the eighth century, uh, the people who are being buried in the cemetery are pretty well off. They're pretty rich as well. So tomb 80 had tons of stuff in it, all that jewelry, all that pottery, scads of drinking vessels, scads of cooking vessels, lots of metal finds. This was somebody very, very wealthy. But not somebody who had a flashy singular burial like, like this. All right, last time we ended by um, reviewing or uh, counting out how many similarities and differences we could find between the description of the funeral games of Patroclus as recounted in Iliad 23 and this site, Tumba, and Mycenaean shaft graves. Now, in that list that you have, at what point in the sequence would you place the story of the funeral and the funeral games. The story, not the text. Because you all remember that for hundreds of years, this was oral poetry. So it doesn't matter about the stories in the other chapters of the book, because it's not fixed how the Iliad is set up it's not completely settled until it's written down. While it's oral poetry, people can mix and match. They can leave out the catalog of ships, which we now have in book two because it's real boring. But they could tell over and over the story of the magnificent burial and funeral games that Achilles put on for Patroclus because it's a very great little episode. So just thinking about the story, where would you put it? Uh, in this sequence. You can have a little chat with your neighbor. So did you say that the centaur was built before tombs one and three? The centaur had to have been made because it was broken and put into tombs one and three. But wouldn't like the tombs have to be there before anything was put into them? Like, I just pictured the tombs being before them. 
<laughs> These tombs are very simple. They're, they're very narrow, shallow um, tombs, and you wouldn't have had to make them until you needed them. Oh, so they made it and then made the centaur. And then... So somebody had that centaur. Okay. And, you know, maybe it was the members of the same family that were buried in tombs one and three. And so... Okay. It, it hit. Yeah. I mean, it's very mysterious, I'm not telling you it's not. But anyway, that's the order that it had to have happened in. Yes? I'm confused. Are we talking about the two games? That's We're talking the about the story in the Iliad story 23. The so the story that I... Was developed. Yeah. Okay. The story that I read you. So there's the whole... All of the details about the funeral itself. And there are, and then Achilles puts on games at the end of it. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So so that, that, whole, that whole piece from Iliad what's now book 23 of the Iliad. All right, where would you put it? After the Mycenaean chamber tombs, and that would mean before, right after, you know, so it's sometime in between, uh, be before the centaur, before whatever you think is the next thing in the list. So early on, but post Mycenaean. That's where you would put it. How many people agree with that? Early on, but post Mycenaean. Not so many of you. Why do you think that that's right? Where, why did you put it there? The language doesn't die out. Everybody continues to talk to each other. It's the script that dies out. Not for a long time. It's oral poetry for hundreds of years. Could have been. Give me another reason why you put it there, somebody who put their hand up. So, so the similarities between the funeral of that we can reconstruct here and the funeral as recounted in Iliad 23 suggests to you that whoever did this was modeling themselves on, inspired by, emulating the story that they heard. So that would argue for the story preceding this. But after Mycenae, because the specifics that we see here, the horse sacrifice, the pyre, the jar, the cremation, the shroud, we don't see those things in Mycenaean palatial period burials suggesting that that story in Iliad 23 postdates the Mycenaean era. That's the argument. Who disagrees? Who puts it someplace else? Most people did not raise their hands, so that's, there's, what's with the rest of you? <laughs> it's just a sleepy day today. <laughs> All right. Where do you put it? Mm -hmm. So in other words, the story is made after something that sounds like this, that, that people did this, and then a story springs up that, that has a lot of similarities to it. Almost as if the story is a kind of narrative of, you know, maybe even this for this hero. Who buys it? Very few of you. Why? The similarities are innate? Well, I mean, there's so many similarities between this and, like, no similarities between other Mycenaean burials. And I, feel, I feel like this is story is for this. Oh, oh, oh. So that the story that we have um, had to have been inspired by this real life as opposed to this real life being inspired by the story. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Wait, what? 
Say that again. <laughs> because the similarities are so specific, you feel that the story was made specifically about this set of events. Yes? Who agrees? Not so many people. Who's they? Well, the people telling the story because they may have forgotten about like the different kinds, like like a Tholos tomb or something like that. You wouldn't forget about Tholos tomb because they were visible. They were visible. All right, so we've got we've got a set of votes, not very many, for after the Mycenaean period, but before this, we have a few outliers who say that the story must come after this and have been inspired by it. Um, is this the only area like this? Yep. Mm-hmm. Tis. Does that do anything for you? Thank you. Yeah. yeah? Like what? Like I think that the story came after. The story came after because it's so specific and, the, and it seems so specifically about this. Because stories are based on things that have actually happened. Like Star Wars? Well, no, I mean, like E.T.? They, they didn't come from nowhere. Like Independence Day? Well, those didn't come from nowhere. Maybe. <laughs> well, they don't come from nowhere, but I don't think they come from real life. <laughs> I need, I need uh, somebody who thinks something different than the two... Um, Propositions that are out there. So many people have not weighed in here. Sir? Uh, it could have been that the author wanted to come up with a really cool idea for a tune. The author. Oh, the person, the person who was singing the song about. The singing the story came up with the idea for, you know, the grand elaborate tune and came up with all these details. And then they decided, hey, this is really, you know, let's do this. So, but that's the argument that we've got. That the, that the story arises, that it's, that it's created. Well, that could be an explanation for why it's not seen before. That could be an explanation for why it's not seen before. Yes, it, it, it could. Are there people who think that the story needs to come first? Are there people who put it first in their list, before the Mycenaean chamber tombs? First in the list. Nobody? You, you put it first in the list? Why? I, I, except for this triumvirate right down here in, in the middle, nobody else thinks that this story has to predate or should predate on the evidence that we've got here. Is that right? We only see one of these. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So, so, so do, you, do you guys realize what you just have said or what you apparently are agreeing on? That this crucial culminating, heroic, integral episode of the Iliad post-dates the Mycenaean period. Is that what you guys think? Are there any pennies dropping in any heads? Well, then you come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> You're lost? What am I trying to say? Help him out here. What am I trying to say? You're saying that it's odd that a story about the Iliad, which is in the Mycenaean period, would actually be created after the Mycenaean period. Except that I didn't say that it was a story that was created in the Mycenaean period. Other than that, though. Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> you know, part of the problem here with the singularity of this find is material from this era is very scarce on the ground. It's remarkable that this was actually found. And the reason that this was found is because there was an accident. And the accident was that these tombs at this end of the building caused the building to collapse. And so a big protective mound was built over the building. In its original form, wood, mud brick, and thatch, what are the odds of something like that being preserved for two to 3,000 years for an archaeologist to come across it? Pretty low. So even if there were a few others of this sort, it'd be, you know, we're lucky that we have this one. So it's, it's pretty dangerous to um, make an argument from silence, you know, to say, well, this is the only one, as if it was only ever the only one. But we do have this. So we have these, we have these few fixed points. We know about Mycenae, important Mycenaean burials, royal burials, in the palatial period. They occurred in Tholoi, which were stone structures. They were largely inhumations. There were not pyres. There were not horses. There were not blah, blah, blah. And apparently, there were not games either. Or anyway, we don't have any necessarily any, any evidence for it. So that's a fixed point. We have the story. That's a real thing. We know that it's floating around. We know that aspects of that heroic saga are true to Mycenaean period reality. Not necessarily Trojan reality, but Mycenaean reality. Because we've got the important places, and indeed they were important places in the Bronze Age. We have this particular story with all of its specifics, and we have this particular find. All right, what are the implications if at some point in the 11th or the 10th century, whichever comes first, the story or this weird burial that somebody just concocts all of these particulars of, and then somebody else makes a song about it and hooks it up with the Iliad. That's, that's one option. And the other option is that this story arose because it's a cool story. It's, it gets made up because people do, people do that. People make up stories, cool stories. And then the people who uh, live in this community make this fantastic burial for the hero of their community as the article that you have is called the hero of Lefkandi. In that um, chronological list, where does the construction of Grave Circle Lego? In the chronological list that you're making, where does the construction of Grave Circle Lego? Before what? Um, right, right. So, so in the Mycenaean period, in the late Mycenaean period, the Mycenaeans themselves had a sense of their specific past, their specific past, and they built something to honor their specific past. And then their civilization collapses. Palatial life disappears. But some of the poetry and the song and the stories continue. And as oral poets will do, those stories are developed. And they change. And there are people living here and there around Greece. And they hear these stories, or maybe they do something that, that produces more information for the stories, like they make this weird burial, or maybe inspired by one of the stories, like the one in Iliad 23, they, they make a burial like that. Why, what, what 
would get people's attention living two to three hundred years later besides the stories? Why would they think that there were these earlier heroic, strong, warmongering people? Why would they have any idea about them? The Tholos tombs are still visible. Not, not only the, the Tholos tombs. Ooh, I forgot I was going to do this. Next. Um, all right, hold that thought. Remember this? Quick, quick, quick. Write down as many similarities between this and this, design-wise, as you can. Quick. As many similarities. All right, give me a similarity. Uh, they take up the whole space. What takes up the whole space? The of the pot. What, what, what about this takes up the whole space? The, the picture. So he, there's this, and there's. The so this picture takes up this box in which it's in. Mm -hmm. But this is the steely. But it doesn't, actually. It covers just over a third. There's, there's a frame. So it's not a picture that takes up the entire stone. And it's not even a picture that takes up the entire frame space. It's a picture in a frame. Right? So, I mean, that's what it is, picture in frame. There's sort of, yeah, there's uh, movement in what way? Uh, yeah, they're kind of swirly. Yeah, kind of swirly. Something else? Oh, well, this is an octopus, and this is, right, the chariot guy, horse, dagger guy. <laughs> so there's something being, something specific being portrayed. It's not just totally design feature. Something else. Um, the swirls connect where like the tentacles on the pot and then the swirls on the above design on the steely, they like connect. So the, so the swirlies are sort of similar in the way that they are uh, yeah. de depicted, although these swirlies of course are the ends of the tentacles of the octopus, but Zach? They're both very detailed. They're both kind of detailed. Uh-huh, that's true. What phase of geometric is this? Is it early geometric? No, why not? Because it's elaborate, because there's a painting of a live creature on it. Right, and what did early geometric look like? What did early geometric look like? You with the twins cap on your head, or whatever that cap is. Design, design, design. You got a little fragment of a piece of pottery. How can you tell it's early geometric? It's mostly. <laughs> it's mostly painted. It's mostly painted. It's practically all black. There, there's very little design. Practically no design. What well, little design there is is geometric. Very little design. Is this middle geometric? Why not? Yo, is this middle geometric? Why not? Help her out.
what, what, what is the difference between a middle geometric design approach and this? This whole pot is taken up with design. The whole pot is taken up with design and there are figures. Okay? So we're in the late geometric period. Similarities between these. Quick. Quick. All right, give me a similarity. Zigzags. Where are the zigzags here? <laughs> the horse figure. Uh, so there's figures, there's figures. Figures and figures. Give me another similarity. Say what? The pot is, uh, you know, more or less completely designed. There are skinny little lines painted down at the bottom where I've put the label on top. So there's, there's bands of um, little geometric sort of bands. So uh, there's swirlies like these swirlies. Something else. That oh, that was yours? Something else. Oh, it's inside the frame. It's inside the frames, that what you were going to say? That would be right. Yes, uh, these are paneled, right? The designs are in panels. The designs are in panels. All the swirlies are connected, at the least from the top of the ceiling, and the little band of swirlies in the middle of the top. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the way in which the, <laughs> I love this detailed discussion of swirlies. <laughs> the way in which the, swir the swirlies are connected is, uh, is very similar. Something else that's similar. It kind of looks like the figures aren't really proportioned very well and that both of the men are almost the same size as their horse. The proportions are wacky, very wacky. What, how, th what is this, a tiny toy pony? That's a problem, don't you think? How would that little thing pull that big chariot with that big guy in it? So the proportions are weird. That's something. Something else. The, uh, horses and people are very simplistic. Simplistic, sort of silhouette-like cutout um, approach to decoration. Good. Something else. So there's a combination of design and figure. There's a combination of design and figure. You may recall, hopefully, that when we talked about the development from submycenaean, from Mycenaean to submycenaean to protogeometric and onward, that there was a tipping point where we went from figure to design. Because for the most part, the Mycenaean pottery is figure, figural. It has things that you can recognize. And it doesn't have empty space taken up with designs. Whereas, so here there's blank space on the pot, and it's blank space. That's fine. Potter's fine with that. That's okay. And here, the potter is like, or the painter uh, says, N uh, there's blank space underneath the horse. I'll just put, you know, this upright and then this uh, T-like thing looks like a game of hangman and then some dots and then some circles and then some diamonds and then some check marks and that's good everything's filled up excellent <laughs> clearly what this painter thinks and that could be what's going on here right I mean what is this this is not a tail <laughs> it was a blank space all right nobody knows when these date are there's a big fight about it big argument Many of you quoted Jerry Rutter's 
um, Mycenaean, uh, the Aegean Bronze Age site about the grave circles and talked about how the grave circles were marked with, with stele. The graves were marked with stele. These are, this is one of those stele. There are 14 of them. But this is the only one with a design like this, although there are a couple others with other designs. I mean with other uh, sort of pictures, picture designs. And then there's some that just have designs. And then there are a couple that are plain. Nobody knows when they date to. Um, and maybe they are from the Mycenaean era. And if they are, they represent one thing. They represent the Mycenaeans marking the graves, and they represent the Mycenaeans um, making this picture, and then this picture, you might interpret it as a hunt, you might interpret it as a chase, you might interpret it as whatever. But the other option is that, as the archaeological remains quite clearly allow you to reconstruct, that these are put up much later. In this era, when looking back at the heroic past was a meaningful thing for people to do, and it was easy enough to recognize that there had been a race of heroes, men who could work with giants to construct walls of stones too large for any individual to imagine crafting and putting in place. And you would have heard these stories, these incredible stories about a long war and magnificent warriors and, and brave and heroic battles and stirring comradeship stories and, and these funeral games. And you would have believed all of that. Why wouldn't you have? You can see the evidence before you. And if that is how you think, or if you're living in the 9th and the 8th centuries BCE in Greece, and that is how you think, who could blame you? Who could blame you? It's not just people then who believed all those stories. It's people now who think when they hear the story that it must be true. Because that's the power of song. That's the power of poetry. That's the power of myth. That's the power of a great story. That you can't believe that it can't be true. In the Greek world after the Mycenaean collapse, people migrated to Attica, and some of those people probably were migrating also here to the area of Euboea, um, where the site of Lefkandi is. Some parts of Greece we know, however, were depopulated, but it doesn't mean they were abandoned. It just means that there were fewer people living there. One of those areas is Messenia. In 1939, when Carl Blagan started excavating at Anoinglianos, Pylos, he had a young man working with him named William McDonald. William McDonald was a graduate student in archaeology. And he went on to get his degree. And in, 19, in the 1950s, he got a job here at the University of Minnesota. And in 1958, he inaugurated the first ever archaeological survey of a region. And the survey was of this region, Messenia. It was a great idea, a great idea for investigating what happened. He wanted to know what everybody wanted to know. What happened after the collapse? What happened to these people? What happened to these lives? So from 1958 to 1968, 
he led a team of archaeologists on painstaking foot survey throughout this region. And it was called the University of Minnesota Messenia Expedition. And it remains the best and best documented archaeological survey of any part of modern Greece. So you should all be very proud because it's so, it's so very cool. And then in the survey, they found this site, Nicoria up uh, in this region overlooking the Gulf of Messenia at the other end of the uh, peninsula from Ano Inglianos. And you all read about the Tholos tomb that was excavated there. And this is it. This is that Tholos tomb. Suggesting that in the Mycenaean period, this was a kind of county seat or an important place. It's not a palatial site. There's no citadel with a megaron here. But a Tholos tomb suggests that, some, that whoever lived here was, um, was reasonably wealthy. And here is a nice color picture of the seal stone that you saw, for those of you that did the reading, in very, very blurry black and white on the first page of your, of your reading. That was found inside, inside the Tholos tomb. On a ridge, a large ridge, 50 by 100 meters, um, and uh, 95 meters uh, above ground level, overlooking the, um, the Gulf of Messenia. The UMI, University of Minnesota Messenia Expedition, survey archaeologists found a site. Uh, and that was extremely important because at the time, in the 1960s when they found this, there had not yet been a site of this a settlement site, not burial site, a settlement site, of this Dark Age period found. What we've been calling the geometric period, what I've been calling the geometric period, is used to be called, uh, and for some archaeologists sometimes it's still called, the, the Dark Ages. It's the same thing. And I tell you that because in your reading, um, MacDonald refers to the phases of this site in Dark Age chronology, Dark Age 1, Dark Age 2, Dark Age 3. And that's essentially the 200 years of the geometric period, the, the 10th through the 8th centuries BCE. Dark Age, same thing. All right. So we're up here on uh, the Nicoria Ridge. And uh, the archaeologists found over the ridge um, houses. Not tons of houses, but houses. Mostly one-room houses, almost all, in fact, one-room houses, mud brick walls, stone foundations, very, very simple. Almost seems like an extended campsite, be like a lot of trailers. And uh, they had excavation areas one, two, three, and th these are um, according to the order in which the excavation areas were opened. And in the middle of the ridge uh, was the most clustered of all of the houses. And that uh, area was area four, Roman numeral four. And in the middle of area four, the excavators found an unusually large house. And it was the first house that they found. And so they called it unit four dash one. And that's what you have a plan of and a handout, unit four dash one at Nicoria. You're looking here at an aerial view. You can see the, the rope for the balloon, a balloon photograph, um, of the foundations of this structure. It ex had two phases. And here's the what's called the state plan. The state plan means uh, a plan that shows everything that was found. So in these two phases, you can see the dark, the black stones are from phase one, and then the gray stones are from phase two. Let's go through Nicoria, unit 4-1, phase by phase. Here's phase one. Uh, about 10 meters by 7 meters. With this nice, um, oh, whoops, with this, with this large paved circle, this elevated paved circle, 
at the rear. In the middle was uh, a pit hearth, that is something that was dug down in the ground and found inside it were charred remains of olive wood, indicating that wood had been burned in there, so that suggesting that it was used as a hearth to cook in, that is, it's like a fire pit, essentially. Pit hearth is like a fire pit. A stone base here in the middle that would have um, supported the, the, the roof, and then um, little strut walls on either side with posts next to them that would also have um, helped hold up the, the pitched roof that would have stood over this. Oh, whoops. Come back. <laughs> um, uh, two entrances, one here on the side, and here's the evidence for it. So you can see here the, the stone foundation and um, you have to imagine the mud brick superstructure. And then a kind of interesting arrangement at the front. Uh, there were uh, some flat lying stones, about five flat lying stones here in between these two larger walls. So indicating that that was some sort of a threshold. But then there was a kind of porch because there was this skinnier um, stone wall, one course wide instead of two courses wide, so it couldn't have really supported a full, um, a full roof, but it could have been the foundations for a kind of half wall, like a parapet wall. And then there were these exceptionally large and sturdy um, mud bricks sitting on the top of the stone, and the excavators thought that those would have supported um, little posts. There were also uh, um, stones, at sort of exceptionally nice flat stones, at the ends of the uh, walls that marked the, the main doorway area. I show you this image of um, two very simple wood columns on either side of a doorway in a small house in rural Greece to help you visualize that even with remains that look quite rudimentary and simple, it, it can translate once you build up the image in your mind into something a little special. Unit 4.1 is the only structure at Nicoria with an additional room, a sort of veranda, anything that suggests um, additional uh, niceties in construction, exceptionally wide stone socket walls as, a, as opposed to um, just uh, more rudimentary single course walls, uh, a stone base here in the middle, and the, and the structure as a whole is about twice as large as any of the other individual um, structures at Nicoria. The roof was almost certainly thatch, and you're looking here at some um, farm steads in rural Greece with thatch roofs to give you a sense of what the roofing arrangements would have been like. Lots of thatch was found in the, embedded in the floor. So here's a reconstruction of phase one of unit 4-1. Here would be that main doorway. Here's the side door. Here is uh, what that parapet wall would be like with its, uh, with its wooden posts on the tops of those, those mud bricks. The uh, much higher thatch roof supported in part by uh, a column, almost certainly wood, um, that stood on that stone base that was about here on the inside. So it's, uh, it's quite a handsome edifice. After uh, about 50 years, or so, um, the Unit 4-1 was expanded. The excavators found an additional wall that abuts this wall, this what had been the, uh, the end of the building. This part of the back wall was dismantled. The building was made just a little bit wider, so the original, um, this original north wall continued in use, but then uh, another wall was um, built around it, and the veranda aspect was 
increased. There, was, there were pebbles, lots of little pebbles, laid down on the ground um, in this uh, front enclosed area. The paved circle was made even more um, noticeable by a, frame, a little frame built around it. And in this new room that was put on the back, there were deep pits in the floor. Uh, oops. So this is a view of the, of the framing wall around the stone circle. Uh, deep pits in which were found charred seeds. Now, the seeds originally would not have been just stuck inside the dirt. They were probably in gourds or sacks or some sort of hollowed out wooden container, but all of those being organic would have d disappeared. They would have deteriorated in the thousands of years in the wet climate of Messenia in the wintertime. And so we're just left with the, with the actual seed remains. So here's a reconstruction of Unit 4.1 in its, in its uh, second phase. And uh, it's, it's even a little bit more impressive because it has this additional um, sort of front yard, yes, uh, porch. You all want to know how we know what the date is of Unit 4.1. And this horrible stuff is how we know what the date is. It's just the dreckiest. Um, the, this is uh, some fragments of the Dark Age pottery that was found inside um, Unit 4.1. And here you see drawings. Things always look better in drawings than they do in real life. Um, so uh, this is, this is <laughs> I put it in quotation marks, fine wear, because it's, it's, it's got some decoration. It's got some paint on it. Uh, and fine wear comprised about 40% of the pottery found in Unit 4.1, which was a much larger percentage than in any of the other structures found at Nicoria, jugs and drinking cups. And you see a comparison with the, with the Dark Age Nicoria um, finds with these uh, protogeometric vessels. These happen to be from, from Athens. And you can, you can get a sense of the, the general similarities, although the Nicoria stuff seems worse, <laughs> just to be a little judgmental. Lots of cooking vessels, interesting sorts of cooking vessels. Um, uh, little cooking pots, braziers, on which the pots would have um, been balanced. Vessels such as these, these happen to be from, these happen to be from Tomb 80 at Lefkandi, but they are very similar to the sorts of cooking vessels that were found at Nicoria. In addition to vessels like this, there were fragments of things that look like essentially a hibachi, you know, a little grill. Inside Unit 4.1 were lots of faunal remains, F-A-U-N-A-L. Fauna is bones, animal bones. A lot of the bones were cow bones, cattle. During the excavations at Nicoria, the fauna was collected very systematically and studied very systematically for all of the phases that uh, the site was occupied in and had uh, a Mycenaean component to it. And uh, what the, the faunal analyst, the person who studied the bones, discovered was that in the late Helladic period, in the Mycenaean period, cattle took up about 20% of the faunal remains. But in the Dark Ages, in the, in the 9th and the 8th centuries, cattle took up about 40%. And in addition to it taking up almost half of all of the remains, the age profile of the cattle bones shifted. Most of the bones came from young animals. What does that suggest, that most of the bones came from young animals, where in the late Helladic period, 
of the cattle that was found, there was a more even cross-section of ages represent. Most of the bones came from young animals. What do you think that means? You're absolutely right that what this means is that younger animals are being killed on purpose because that's not the natural mortality curve. So it suggests selective, purposeful behavior, that younger animals are, are picked out and, and killed as opposed to um, the kind of remains just being uh, representative of the natural occurrence of, of, life, of lifespan. Well, there's, there isn't any evidence that they're going hungry. I mean, people are living here for 200 years, so they don't, like, die out. <laughs> um, they don't need them to breed as much before they, they have more of They, right. They, so, so they're eating cattle younger. In other words, meat is a much more significant part of the diet. And what it also means, therefore, is what are the cattle... What were the cattle likely to be being used for in the late Hellenic period? Could be dairy. Dairy and labor. Because that's how you get older animals. Dairy and labor. So they're agricultural animals. And here, instead, cattle are being raised, it's more like cattle ranching. Cattle are being raised for food. And so as, as you point out, they're, they're killed off just as soon as they're good to, good to eat, more, more often than not. So, uh, so the, the diet is um, changed significantly. All right. Um, on Thursday, we will continue talking about Nicoria, and you will get your papers back. <laughs>